Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Thank you everyone for joining me today. I have the high honor of being here with Bob Lang. Bob is one of the industry's leading technical experts. He is also an expert options trader and founder of Explosive Options, where he has created a trading community built on trust, teaching people how to succeed with options trading. Thank you so much for being here with me today, Bob. So how are you doing? I'm doing great, Rosanna. It's great to be with you. It's a beautiful day here. Spring is coming and uh, you know the weather is starting to perk up nicely here. Uh, we were recently in the 40s. And now we're we're looking 50s and 60s coming in later this week. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. It's shorts weather, just like it was when I was living in California. <laughs> well, for Massachusetts, that's certainly an early spring you're having there um, in uh, March. I know in April, it can get quite chilly in uh, the Boston area. So hopefully it continues for you. So Bob, you have a long history with options trading. You started op explosive options back in 2011. How did it all begin before 2011? So um, before 2011, Rosanna, I was I was working with a fellow um, with a company called BigTrends.com. His name is Price Headley, and started with him in about 2004. And we ran a couple of uh, started a couple of services, um, options trading services, and they just exploded. I mean, they just did really really well, and you know they're both uh, very very successful products. Started one in 04, and then the next one we started in 06. And um, you know, we, we were we were just swimming, uh, doing extremely well. And all the way through the uh, great financial crisis, the services were doing well. So um, we, we we parted ways in 2011, um, and you know, still very um, cordial. And um, I thought it was time for me. I had seven years under my belt of running um, option trading services, and kind of knew, figured out the nuts and bolts of how these things work and decided to do it on my own. And I got started um, in, in, in March or May of 2011. Um, you know, I didn't have a lot of subscribers at, at the time, but um, I was writing for uh, the streak.com, which I was still write for today. Um, and I, I had put a couple of trade ideas out there. One in particular, a lot of people followed me on, um, Rosanna was um, in October of uh, 2010, um, uh, I, I posted on, on, their, on their website, I said, I'm buying some calls on Google um, at the time was um, $600 or something like that. So I bought the, like the six, I, I think the stock was trading at about 560. So I bought the 590 calls right in front of earnings. I bought them like at a buck. And then four days later, I'm selling them at 10. And, you know, it turns out there's a lot of people who read that and a lot of people who followed it. And then a lot of people were extremely happy to get a thousand percent return on, on a, uh, on a trade. It was only lasting four days. So um so I got I, I I that kind of you know put me on the uh, on the radar screen. So a lot of people followed me four months about six months later when I got the service going, and you know what we we took off from there. Um, and then in 2014 started up the chat room, which is extremely popular place where people uh, not only just trade with me but they learn about options trading, learn about risk management, a lot of different uh, aspects of options. Um, we buy puts, we do everything. Uh, manage the um, manager accounts, and then I, I have a spread trader service that started up a couple of years after that, and uh, and he, and here we are, 2023. We're almost um, you know uh, 12 years in now, and uh, um, very happy with how things are going. Last year was a tough year, but you know for many for us as well too, admittedly. But you know for we're we're pulling it back uh, to the positive side in 2023. Wonderful, very impressive uh, history you have there. Bob, I'd like to know, when did you begin trading? And when you began, did you start with shares or did you start with options straight out? So Rosanna, I, I started trading um, more seriously back in 1996 and seven. And wow. so I just gotten my master's degree and uh, uh, took a, uh, I, I was wa looking for a new job and got my master's degree in, in my MBA uh, and I was looking for a new job. And I uh, found one, uh, I was the, pension investments manager for Sunkiss Growers. Sunkiss, you know, lemons, oranges, candies, and so forth. So um, I uh, I was I was their pension fund manager. We had a $230 million pension. So I was uh, charged with 
trying to grow those assets that were um, that were in there in the pension fund so they could deliver um, payments to their retirees, right? So um, we had we had um, I had to do a lot of work in returning over that uh, portfolio uh, of managers. But in the meantime, uh, you know the stock market was starting to get interesting. So I had a little Schwab account, um, Rosanna, about seven thousand dollars. That's it. And I started buying some stocks, you know, in 1996, 97. And, uh, you know, there was an opportunity to buy into some of these dot-com stock names mm -hmm. that <clears throat> were cheap at the time. And, uh, you know, they were being bid up like crazy. So um, one in particular was called Infospace, INSP, which was uh, a startup from a, a, a former Microsoft manager. And that was the stock that I bought on the IPO price at $15 and it took off and took off and went up and split, went up and split four, four different times. And that stock, you know, made me, you know, took my, helped me take my $7,000 account all the way up to about a half a million um, wow. by the, uh, by the start of 20, of uh, 2000, uh, February, 2000. So yeah, it was, it was, it was crazy. Now I, I, I won't, I won't take credit for being smart, Rosanna. I'll, I'll take credit for being a little lucky and being in the right place at the right time and being mm -hmm. willing to take risk. Um, but it, it, it didn't all end that well, because as you can, as you can imagine, uh, just after that point in time, about March or April, the, the, the dot com bubble started to burst mm -hmm. and I didn't recognize it at the time. So again, I was, this was over 20 years ago, 22 years ago is much greener when it comes to risk. I, I didn't, I, I was in that denial phase of, you know, the markets mm -hmm. can't go down, can they? I of mean, this is, it's not, no, you're never, you're never going to see the markets go down. Mm -hmm. And even if you, you know, took a, took a chisel to the foundation, it still seemed to be fine until they chisel a little bit more. And then all of a sudden, you know, the weakness of the foundation started to, to crumble. And, and, and that was it. So I, I, you know, a very short period, I did take a, some, some of that money out, of course, um, to start up a, a, my, another business, but still, I, I, I still, I got devastated. I got crushed and that was only stocks, Roseanne. If I was playing options, who, who knows how well I could have could have done, but still, um, uh, I, I take those. I, I take that experience as a huge lesson for me, of um, in terms of understanding risk management and 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 learning and and knowing that bad things can happen after and just after good things um, happen to you as well. Things move quickly in the market. Thank you so much for sharing that experience. Two thousand and the two thousand one dot bomb wasn't too kind for many people. Um, we learned a lot through those difficult times and that's why you've gained all this experience. And when you trade now, it's an expertise based intuitive decision-making that you utilize from all these years of experience. And in my opinion, in, in fields like trading, it's experience that matters. And having been through those times with those emotions, it's about having skin in the game. And that's why, I mean, I'm not a fan of paper trading. Maybe for some people, I've never paper traded. Um, it's it's about those emotions. It's how can you deal with those emotions when you're in that trade? Can you be consistent? Can you be disciplined? It's all those elements. Um, but you learn through the difficult times and and uh, you, we turn that into positive experiences later on um, yeah. as challenges do that's bring right. forth opportunities. Um you know, I'd like to know um, how you, because you are on the inside, how have you seen the options trading transform from when you first began options trading to now with all the zero DTE and the mass amount of people jumping into options? How different is it to you? Well, when I first started trading um, options, Rosanna, you know, um, the pricing differentials have changed quite drastically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you now now that nowadays you could you trade with in, in terms of pennies. Can you imagine? Um, you know, fractional moves in in in, in options made make would make it really difficult to to make money um, between you know, unless you were playing between the bid and the ask spread. And mm -hmm. most of us uh, don't do that. We know most of us are not are not making a market in in options. Most of us are just simply trying to. Um, find an option uh, in, in, in have it move in a per certain direction. And so we can, we can make money on it. But um, I, I think the, the uh, ease and the, the volume and the, and, and the amount of supply that's out there in options has really um, risen through the, over the past 20 years and made it a lot easier for people to, to use options. Now, and I, I also know that there's a lot of people out there 
who are scared of of, of options trading. They think it's voodoo. Mm-hmm. They think there's so much mystery out there that they're they're and and all they hear about is, oh, so and so just you know, uh, racked up huge losses in in options. All they're doing is gambling, you know. And I I get it. Listen, if you want to gamble, you, you don't have to go to Las Vegas. You could certainly do it through the options market. And believe me. The person on the other side of the trade will be very happy to take your money away from you, right? Just like, just like the house would do it in in Las Vegas or or Atlantic City or wherever you wanted to go. So I, I think there's a way of uh, of using options that where where you're you know to your advantage, um, certainly whether you're buying or selling and or even doing simul doing those simultaneously um, to to take advantage of trends and take it and, and create an edge for yourself. Um, I think that that's one of also one of the things, Dutch, is because of the supply and the volume, Rosanna. It's it's also the ability for you to create an edge uh, against the rest of the crowd, against the market, to help you um, make some profits here and there. Listen, at the end of the day, it's all about you know I'm gonna if I can build create an edge for myself, I'm gonna get I, as I'm gonna quote a friend of mine who used to when I used to work in the retail business, I'm gonna get mine. I don't care what anybody else is doing. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get mine. I'm going to make my, my money. And, yeah. and, I'm, and I'll make mine. I'll get out. And I'll let somebody else get in there and make theirs. So it keep it, I keep that mindset every mm-hmm. single day. Absolutely. I'm going to make mine today. And then uh, tomorrow, you know, tomorrow's Thursday. And it's another day. And then Friday. And then I can work on Friday. So that's, you know, it's just one day at a time. I love that mindset. It's a success is a, an abundance mindset. I say, and the market is an abundance mindset. It's not that my win is your loss and vice versa. We can all have a piece. Sure. And I love utilizing options as well. It's a great way to maximize your profits and minimize your risk. And you said it perfectly. People are scared of options. They think of it as pure gambling. When I, and, and, and someone as experienced as you in options knows that it, helps minimize risk. And with the sideways market that we've had, and we probably will continue for some time, options are ideal, uh, in my opinion, a a great way to play the market. So I'm so excited to learn about your strategies and and your options, but I want to first get into the macro. Um, Well, first of all, you are a technical expert, I love your eBooks. There's this one eBook that you have, Know Your Options, and it's the exact title, How to Trade Options for Income Using Technical Analysis. Excellent. So you're an expert te- in, in technicals, but you also speak about macro, you utilize fundamentals. So let's start with the macro. What are your thoughts in this macro environment that we're in right now? Well, I'm kind of a Fed nerd, Rosanna, and and I, I am too. For a while. I, I I've been <laughs> studying the Federal Reserve and um, their posture and how they manage monetary policy for well over 20 years. And you know why 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 would I why would I why on earth would I be um, interested in this um, dry group of uh, of bankers and economists? Um, they're probably you know the most boring people you would find in a conversation at a party. Well, you know, they, they, they have a huge direct impact on how we proceed in, in the marketplace. And if you make that connection between the Federal Reserve, liquidity, and the stock market, you, then, you, then you, you soon understand the importance of, of, of how that Federal Reserve uh, uh, policy impacts how we invest and how we trade in the stock market. So I, I think that that's, that's a certainly a crucial element for me to start with. You know, I always, um, I always do an evaluation at the end of the year, Rosanna, about uh, say, you know, I, I start evaluating where we're at. First question I say, I ask myself uh, among seven or eight other questions is where is the Fed? I don't mean, you know, I don't mean location wise. Yeah. I, what I mean is where are they in terms of policy, mm-hmm. right? Are they, are they hawkish? Are they neutral? Are they dovish? Is somewhere in between? You know, is there an extreme level? Because that is going to impact the way I proceed and way I trade and invest in the markets, and it should impact everybody's uh, uh, everybody's investment mosaic as they as they move forward. So I think, as far as the macro is concerned, you know, obviously the economy is important and, and watching um, economic trends and, and and that sort of thing, but it's really what the Fed policy is all about that really makes the biggest difference 
for how I uh, how I approach the markets and trading. Perfectly said. You know, there's that expression: "Don't fight the Fed." Um, that's Marty. So, that's that's Marty Zweig from some forty years ago. It, he exactly. said it back then, and it's it's just as true today as it was absolutely. back then. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's the backdrop of liquidity for the market. It's key, and you know, um, with this recent banking crisis that we've had, um, and it seems that it can spread to others. Um, we don't know what's in store for us. Plus, we know that we have persistently elevated inflation rising core month over month. It's still over 5%, the core uh, year over year. And, you know, it's, you know, between the inflation, the low growth and a very tight labor market, it seems to me that the Fed's fund rate should be in the mid fives. Of course, now we're seeing it, um, you know, the market showing that we're gonna get pauses and cuts. The Fed watch tool um, on CME, shows that we should be getting some cuts this year. What are your thoughts? I mean, of course, it's always a lot of moving parts, always moving. But as of right now, what what are you thinking for 2023? So, th so this goes back to what I just said a, a few moments ago about understanding where the Fed is. And so it also goes into tuning out the noise from anybody else's views and opinions, because we only have one Fed. We only mm -hmm. have one Fed chairman, and that's Jay Powell. And we, we don't have anybody else making policy uh, outside of the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee, right? So um, it doesn't really much matter what the data is, is telling us if the Fed is interpreting it their own way. No, I, I, you know, I, but, but let me step back. I, I don't really mean that we should ignore the data. That's absolutely not true. We got to pay attention to what the data is, try and piece it together, the roadmap to where um, we think monetary policy is going to go. Yet the Fed has a certain way of interpreting the data. And if we're not in tune and in line with what they're, how they're interpreting it and how they're using it to craft policy, then we're always going to be um, one step behind the Fed. Now, for, for years and years, they've been accused of being too slow, dragging their feet, um, using have more lip service than, than action. And that's a fair that's a fair criticism, and I think um, by and large you would. I've heard I've heard some of the Fed governors actually admit to that and say, "Look, you know what? We were slow." I mean, look at what happened. Look, Rosanna, look what happened last year. What did Chair Powell say? Oh, it's inflation is transitory. He was wrong. <laughs> he was one hundred percent completely mm -hmm. wrong. I, I don't know. I don't. Exa I don't know exactly if he said those words that I'm wrong, but he said he he, he came about very 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 close to saying that. So you know, um, so that that being the case, listen, you you have to. When you have that, have to say again that mea culpa out there, and you say, "Look, you know what? I, I I blew it." Then then you have to take some action and 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 see what the problem is. And this apparently this is a listen, inflation is a serious problem, and uh, if it doesn't get arrested and corrected, it's going to have a it's going to hammer our, our economy for a long time. Because we're we're a fiat we're, we're we're an economy based on a fiat currency, right? The dollar, U.S. dollar, like a lot of other economies are have their own currencies as well. So it, it's based on paper and it's based on faith that the government will 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 pay you pay you back, right? It's not based on hard assets like like the dollar or like the mm -hmm. like gold or silver, mm -hmm. right? So there, so um, unfortunately, um, when we run into problems over the past hundred years since the Federal Reserve has been around, there was only been one way to 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 get yourself out of a problem that was been printing. You got to mm -hmm. print more money, right? So that causes inflation. When, when the, what is the mm -hmm. definition of inflation? Too many dollars chasing too few goods, mm -hmm. right? So when the when the when you have a lot of dollars chasing after those goods, you see prices start rising, and uh, you know, and 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 they and they and they stay up there. They stay sticky. Look, listen. You know what? Chipotle burritos went from about um, ten and a half to eleven dollars up to about fourteen, right? And so if we do suddenly, Rosanna, get inflation starting to come down, um. Do you think Chipotle is going to go back to ten or ten and a half to eleven dollars on the burrito? Probably Very not. Unlike, no. Right? They're going to keep those prices up there. So that's what they call sticky inflation. So we're going to get uh, have a lot of that going on. So, so get you know, getting back to your original question, I think it's important to 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 understand where policy is, and for the, recognize that the Federal Reserve is interpreting the data a certain way, and what we should do is be aligned with the Fed and say, look, you know what? We can cry and scream all we want mm -hmm. and say, hey, 
Federal Reserve, can't you see it? These inflation numbers are coming down. They're doing it. I mean, maybe maybe they are, maybe they're not. I, I don't I don't quite see it personally, but you know, there's a lot of people who are looking mm-hmm. at the data and they're showing me charts and say, can't you see it? It's going from top here to that. I mean, I I you know, like again, I don't really quite see it in, when I go shopping, but you know what? Maybe, maybe they're <laughs> right. The Fed isn't seeing it that way. So you know what? The Fed isn't seeing it that way. We're going to have a higher interest rates for a lot longer. And that's what they said last last meeting. Higher mm-hmm. for longer and maybe yes. even sooner and maybe even faster, right? Absolutely. Perfectly said. You know, I for me, I've been listening to Powell speak. And to me, it's the same tone as last summer when I heard him talk about data dependence. When I heard that, I was like, oh, well, the data to me, when I analyze the CPI and I see it's rising month over month, it's not good. And so I think they have to maintain a restrictive monetary policy and they will continue. So whatever the markets are trying to price in or say, um, you know, the swaps market, you know, I it, they always revise anyways and they'll adjust and they'll change. Look how they change from January to February and they will change again. So like you said perfectly, um, eliminate the noise and just That's try right. to focus on What's most important, who's creating the monetary policy, we know at the Fed, and just listen to what their message is, and we see the data. And, you know, I like to mention Deutsche Bank, they did say, it was a great quote, they said, once inflation goes over 5%, it can take up to a decade to come back down. So it takes time, and we know, right, and we know from the 70s and 80s, knowing our history, we know it takes time. So, um agree with you on that. Thank you so much, Bob, for those great points. You know, I like to say the only certainty is um, uncertainty, because we certainly have a lot of uncertainty and a lot of moving parts that keep moving um, amidst us. So all we can do is just focus on the data, like you said, focus on and price at the end of the day with trading. So let's talk about fundamentals. I know you utilize fundamentals and there's a lot of talk about earnings recession. And, uh, you know, we know margins are compressed. And like you just said, prices are still elevated. Companies are feeling the pinch. Now the consumer is pulling back. If we get more layoffs, if we do, people are going to be out of work, need less spending. You know how the cycles are, how the economic cycles work. What are your thoughts with fundamentals at the S&P? and stocks overall. So we have an earnings season coming up real soon, Rosanna, coming up, starting up in about two weeks. I think the uh, uh, we'll, we'll see the banks starting to report mm-hmm. um, after the Easter holiday, uh, the first uh, first shot. And then, you know, there's some some companies that actually had a good uh, fourth quarter. They reported good earnings in uh, in the first quarter, Netflix being one of them. And, you know, the, the stock gapped up and it went up quite sharply and came back down. It's kind of like, Right back down to where it was before it reported earnings in uh, in January, um, but you know I I think the jury is out right now. I think they're um, by and large. I think um, companies are either going to um, be flat to slightly lower in in, mm-hmm. in this in this quarter. Now now here's the thing. Here's here's the rub is um, GDP now, which is a a number produced um, by the Atlanta Fed. Uh, mm-hmm. Rafael Bostic is the president of the Atlanta Fed. So they produce a number um, which puts a lot of different uh, inputs in for uh, GDP. And so their their latest uh, GDP uh, model says that we're we're going to be at about 3.2% in the first quarter. Pretty strong quarter, right? I mean, sort of coming off of a pretty decent quarter in fourth quarter of 2022. Now, let's remember something. Um, the first quarter of this year is going up against a negative quarter of last year. Remember, we had we actually technically were in a recession um, by definition mm-hmm. in 2022. We had a negative quarter in Q1 and a negative quarter yes, in Q2, back back. right? Mm-hmm. So you know, by all by all uh, uh, definitions, we were in it. We were in a recession last year, but nobody nobody seemed to care about that. They, they, oh well, you know, the, the, there were all sorts of excuses as to why it wasn't a recession. Whatever. But so we're we're going up against negative comps for for last year um, in 2022 and in in the second quarter of uh, of 2023 versus 2022. So we'll we'll have to see how that manifests itself. But if we have a strong first quarter, if that's right, and it moves into uh, second quarter, you know, it doesn't seem doesn't appear to me 
that um, you know recession is is going to happen unless we have a huge drop in in demand and volume and so forth. You know, the only way we're gonna it's gonna happen, Rosanna, is uh, if the job market um, really loosens up and we start getting negative growth numbers. And I think that's not gonna happen until about September of or October mm -hmm. of of this year. Um, so I, 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 going back to your, your, your question about the fundamentals, I, I don't think the fundamentals are as great as people believe they are, um, mm -hmm. but they're not as bad as, as, mm -hmm. as some other people believe they are. So we're somewhere in the middle there. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I do think that some companies are going are gonna to do well. Um, I do think that the supply issue, uh, supply chain issue problems that we had before have proven that they're just about over. Um, you know, I mean, for uh, I would I'd be going to the grocery store. I get a I I'm looking for bottles of Gatorade, which is you know stocked by stocked by Pepsi. And you know, about six eight months ago, they're they were hardly there. Now they're now now the shelves are full. So, you know, that, that one little anecdote that's <laughs> helpful of the supply chain uh, issues being resolved. That that's great. Um, but it, it, any anyhow, the the fundamentals I think you know is important to follow, but. Uh, I don't. I don't think that we're um, we're out of the woods yet, and I don't think we're past um, any uh, potential recession in uh, 2023. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, the supply chain shock that we had, uh, the bottleneck effect, and everything that we had has cleared itself up. Um, definitely, I'm noticing that on the manufacturing front with my business. Um, but yeah, I think we're. It's going to take time, like you said. We're not out of the woods. It's probably not as bad as the biggest bears think, and it's definitely not as good as the biggest bulls think. Probably somewhere in the middle, probably near that, you know, that flat, like you said, maybe more on the downside. Um, I, I also believe that's what we're going to be seeing. So I agree. Um, yeah. But so let's enter technicals. Technical analysis, your forte, which is key. Um, what are you... What do you utilize on a daily biz basis? Uh, what are your top indicators? What do you look for when you look at the charts? Well, I'm, I'm going to step back just for a second before I, I jump into that because um, when I was at so when I back to my intro when I was talking about my time at Sunkiss, I was there for three and a half years. I was a fundamentals guy. I didn't really follow the technicals much. My dad liked to to, to follow the charts, um, but it really wasn't my forte until I understood that. Um, you know, stock can go up and exceed extraordinary valuations just because the technicals were real strong. So I, I had to adopt that mm -hmm. um, philosophy that, you know, it's not fundamentals that drive stocks in the short run. It's really technicals. It's mm -hmm. really the technical. So so I, 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 I again, I cut my teeth. And, you know, what we talked uh, before we got on here about Brian Shannon was one of the first books that I, I ever read about technical analysis mm -hmm. and uh, multiple time frames book um and and it was it was a, it was an eye opener really sort of game changer for me in, in learning and understanding that you know I'm, I'm a pattern follower i look at I look for patterns mm -hmm. to to re, to to open up and to repeat over and over again because human nature doesn't change uh so i i look for i look for patterns and and, and i'm a believer that price is uh is the king and uh price and volume are the two key indicators mm -hmm. that i pay most close attention to if I didn't have any other indicator out there, Rosanna, I, and all I was looking at the price action and the volume, I could I could make a good assessment for where stocks are going to be going um, into the future, based just based on those. But I do look at a lot of other indicators as well too. I like to use the MACD. I guess I like to use money flow, uh, relative strength, um, and some other uh, combinations of indicators like the Traders Dynamic Index. Um, I'll and I'll throw in a few others as well too, kind of fun ones like the. Um, uh, the ulcer index, uh, Alexander Elder's index as well too. Um, so uh, I, I think you you can get um, overloaded with a lot of different indicators. Mm -hmm. I think you only really need to use like an oscillator and a couple of little momentum indicators. I use moving averages, Bollinger bands, that sort of thing. Um, it's kind of give me a, 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 a little temperance with when it comes to looking at price and where it's at and where it might be going. And 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 that's it, you know. And the price action bars, I use candlestick charting um, as well too, and 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 volume bars. So all those together, um, it helps me to make a quick decision on where I think that that stock is going to go. And why do I have to be quick? It's because options don't give you the the chance to think quickly, think over this thing for you know, gnaw at it for 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 hours and hours and hours. 
you're going to lose your opportunity. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've been in, I've, I looked at charts and I've needed to get in the trade in five seconds, boom, before it took off to the upside. So th that's the importance of, of being able to do that. So I've looked at thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of charts over my career. And uh, it's, it's so important to, to use technical analysis and supporting your, uh, your trading view. Absolutely. It's that pattern matching that you do. And then you recognize those patterns and you compare them with other prototypes in your head from vast years of experience. And that's exactly in, uh, the expertise based intuitive decision making those quick decisions based on you quickly noticing those similarities or differences in patterns. Um, very, uh, very impressive action right there. Um, I find with traders especially someone like you. Now, I read in your article that you said, let, let's apply this to the market right now for as an example for everyone. The oscillators went towards neutral. So you think there could be a potential buy signal. Could you explain that line that you used? So the McClellan oscillators, are the ones that I use, Rosanna, there's other, other oscillators as well too, but th these are breath oscillators, uh, breath indicators. So they tell us, where um, leading um, stocks are 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 ahead of uh, declining stocks. So you know, on a particular day, you you might get um, you know, like maybe on today, I think I saw the the advancing stocks were up like twenty six hundred, and the declining stocks were five hundred. So you had a five to one um, positive to negative breath ratio. So breath is an important element. Not it's it's looking at things horizontally rather than vertically, right? If we if we think of stock price and so forth and volume, looking at things vertically, this is looking at things a little bit differently horizontally, and we can put things together, um, match those two things together, and you get a real important um, explosive um, type of decision making uh, tool for you. But the breadth is so important because when when more and more people are buying than selling. It's clear as day. It's obvious, right? And and if you, if you're of the notion like me that these things tend to um, jump forward more and more times in a row, well, you can say to yourself, well, shoot, we're at five to one positive today. I missed it. Darn it! I guess I'll have to wait till the next time. Well, that next time could be tomorrow. It could be Friday or it could be next week. The thing is, is that we we don't necessarily have to wait. To, to for these indicators to to turn, they're already they're already turning. They're like coincident indicators. So I think when when we look at the oscillators so forth like that, when I get a, a change, we were like barely negative yesterday, and then we went fairly strongly positive today. Now now obviously these oscillators, Rosanna, can hit overbought, oversold, mm -hmm. and you know they and what 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 ha what happens when you hit overbought you just the buyers are done there's nobody mm -hmm. out there to buy when there's nobody out there to buy who's left mm -hmm. you got sellers left right people are going to same thing happens to the downside when everybody's just you know said just get me out i can't i i can't stand it anymore i'm just going to sell and all of a sudden you know the buyers step in and, and start picking up the bargain so it works it, it works in the opposite yes. it works at the extremes mm -hmm. but i think the, the the important point here is that these oscillators tell you give you a clue as to the direction and the trend of the market. Absolutely. Thank you. And it's about supply and demand and, you know, the buyers and sellers, when you run out of buyers, what's going to happen next? Well, you're just probably going to start getting some sellers That's um, right. and just works that way. So seeing those patterns, um, you know, there's some critical levels that we're looking at for SPX and, you know, 4,000 is a very challenging level. And we look like we're in a range between 3,800 to 4,200. So would you say it's been a sideways market and you probably are thinking it will continue that way from what you're seeing with the numbers? Yeah. So, you know, in, in 2022, Rosanna, we had a, a range in the SP 500. I think it was, I'm going to say it was about 1,400 points. Mm -hmm. And it was about the, a little bit higher than that in 2021, much higher, much higher than that in 2020 about 7, 18, 17, 1800. So if we think that maybe the upside is capped at about 4,200, mm -hmm. almost hit that in January and in, uh, at the end of, at beginning of February. And then if the downside is about 3,800, possibly down to 3,600, mm -hmm. you know, we're only talking about a 400 to 600 point range. Can you imagine that between mm -hmm. 400, 600 points for the next nine months? We're already out of the first quarter, right? 
and we we and we're um, I think S P five hundred is up two percent for the year. Um, that's not a bull market. That's mm -hmm. a that's a sideways market. And, mm -hmm. and and I have a definition for bull and bear markets. My bull my definition for a bull market is one that goes up, and <laughs> a bear market is one that doesn't go up. Exactly. Notice, notice I say it didn't go. I, I didn't yes. say the bear market is one that goes down. I agree. Um, I think if you're in a sideways market, that's going to be the most frustrating environment mm -hmm. for anybody, right? Because if you're if if you're waiting, sitting there waiting, look, let's let let's face let's face it. 2022 was a disaster for most people. I think mm -hmm. I think eight out of 10 people lost money, if not more, in 2022. And so what are they trying to do this year? They're trying to get it back, right? And a lot of people have money in technology. They have money in NASDAQ. And we can see the NASDAQ is about performing uh, the rest of the market because that tends to be the place where people are, are pushing their money to. I heard it. It was funny uh, the other day, Rosanna, I was hearing somebody said that technology being the safety trade I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> are you kidding? The safety trade is in treasuries, yeah. right? Four percent in in treasury mm -hmm. in two-year treasury bills. That that's where your safety trade is. So I think there's a little distortion going on here because um, there's a lot of frustration with what happened last year, and there's a lot of um, um, misinformation and, mm -hmm. and misunderstood uh, things. And that's why you know what, more and more people pile into the technology, Rosanna, and they start feeling like. This is the safety trade. I got to put all my money in there. What's going to end up happening? They're going to get whacked. Mm -hmm. They're going to get whack a mole after at the end of the day, and they're 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 going to have a, a a very difficult time understanding. You know why am I losing money here? Because the, the this was supposed to be the quote unquote safety trade, and there's there's no such thing. Absolutely. I mean, when you see risk free rates are higher than the earnings yield of the S and P five hundred and the Nasdaq. You have to wonder, you know, um, I'm also a fundamentalist at heart. And so to me, the T-bills, the full week, you could do a ladder, you can, so you can stay liquid. Um, you know, there's so many other options. You know, you, I feel like I need to be compensated to take on risk. And the market being sideways, you have to be very nimble. Um, you know, you can't just buy the dip and, and expect to hold. I mean, those axioms are gone. So there's a recency bias. You know, people don't recall back to you know 2007 2008 time period and that's where the the risk free rates are back to you know they're back to that time period so people don't recall or it's just not fresh in their memory you know it's that recency bias so they keep thinking that they can buy the dip or they can go to tech because it's going to run back up because that's the one that was beaten down so it's got to go back up and it's you know there's so many other factors to that and uh, I agree with you um, with, you know, some of it is just, um, you know, I, I don't understand the exuberance in some of these stocks and, and these sectors, uh, maybe a short, you know, short term play, but I'm not too certain about, you know, for the rest of the year. Um, I, I've, I've, I learned a long time ago, Rosanna, that, um, you know, this is not your grandfather's market anymore. And what used to be called buying hold has <laughs> turned has turned into hope and pray. Yeah, exactly. You know, so I mean, you know, it's no, you know, I mean, listen, you know what? We all learn. This is the reason why people don't understand and, and have difficulty with options because most people, you know, are not option. We're, we're not option players when back in the day. I mean, options. Uh, eight, actually, next month is the 50th anniversary uh, of the first introduction of of options, 1973. Um, and uh, some really good stuff out there, by the way. Larry McMillan is writing. Um, has had some good interviews and articles. Um, if you take a look at uh, his stuff out there. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the thing is, is that, um, you know, most people have not had experience with options over the past hundred plus years. And if they did, it was very in a very light way. Um, but they understand stocks and they understand what what their mm -hmm. what their ancestors did uh, with, with stocks. And, and that's how they built their wealth. You know, most today, most people build their wealth through real estate. But back in the day, people were building their wealth by buying stocks like Coca-Cola and Polaroid and RCA, which were you know hot numbers back in the in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, um, and and all your parents and grandparents told you was just buy it, stick it away, get that dividend, and look at it you know when you're ready to retire, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not how we you know we all should be active managers today. We all should be exactly. actively managing our companies because look what what happens if you if you if you did that 
and you had Silicon Valley Bank in your portfolio? <laughs> How would you feel today, right? What if you had, you know, 10% of your portfolio in that stock? And, and you just good. thought, well, let me just buy it and hold it and stick it, stick it away. You're, you're done. You know, you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're way behind the eight ball than everybody else is. And, and how are you going to make that up? Exactly. You've lost, you've lost precious amount of time uh, in order to try and, and get that. And that, and that would be for somebody who's not necessarily an expert in, in, in investing, right? Mm -hmm. Excellent points. So now we all want to know your strategy. Now you're an options trader. Are you mostly options? Are you also any, do you have any long-term holdings at all, like in indexes or ETFs? Um, or are you just focused on options trading? I I have I have like three or four different trading accounts. I have client accounts that I that I manage as well too. Um, I I do have some retirement accounts where I have stocks in there which I've had for a while. Um, I like to buy IPOs. I like to buy spinoffs. Mm -hmm. You know, I bought I I bought um, Ferrari when it first came out. That's a fun stock, fun company. Mm -hmm. So I bought that when it first came out. I've held that had that for years. Um, and I do have, uh, you know, a couple of other IRAs that I trade options in as well, too. Um, but, you know, mostly, you know, I, I when I in my stock account, it's it's just I, I just like to, you know, I, I move some money around, and keep a lot of cash in there. But I I like to buy companies that, that I that I know that I understand. <clears throat> but, you know, if situation changes. I'm out. Mm -hmm. I'll move out because that's what you have to do. You have to understand companies that you that you own. You don't necessarily have to have a, a huge influence in, the, in those companies, but you know you you have to you can't turn a blind eye if something bad happens. If something bad happens, you have to um, make an adjustment and say, "Look, you know what? I'm out. I, I got to I got to move on." I think that's a difficult thing for people to do. It's difficult for people to to a get out of a trade and b admit they're wrong. You know, I mean, the ego gets in the way, and they they start saying. They're they're in denial and saying no 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 it's going to go back up it comes back to that hope and trade hope and pray thing instead of the buy and hold right so um, you you start thinking that you know things are going to improve with with and it's the most irrational thought around but you know most people are, are like that I think you have to understand what you own and that's what I try to do with my stocks. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, people have the sunk cost bias, you know, they feel that once they put a little money in, they, they can't cut that little loss. They, they want to keep holding and then it turns into a bigger loss and we all have loss aversion. Uh, so there are a lot of issues there with biases that go on uh, and see emotions. I mean, emotions are healthy. We're human. We all have emotions. That's how we react from those emotions that count. Um, you said a few excellent points. I love your thing about that it's a bear market. If it's not going up, it's a bear market. Agree completely. The bear markets, I love, Brian Shannon actually said this, if they don't scare you out, they wear you out. And yeah. it's so true. I mean, right now, it's a, it can be very brutal for many people if they don't know the patterns and don't remain so nimble. I mean, it's a sideways market. It'll shake you around. And so, yeah, it's a, to me, it's a typical of a bear market. Um, you know, I want to talk about your options trading strategies. First of all, please tell us your goals. Is it for income, reducing risk? Do you utilize it to, you know, like selling puts, you know, uh, just cash secured puts? Do you use that to buy shares cheaper or to lower your cost bases? Do you utilize covered calls? Please tell us all that. Yeah. So the, the last strategy you talked about, covered calls are great for investment, uh, long-term investment strategies. I don't have a lot of uh, a lot of shares of of stocks that I can write calls against. But again, you know, what, what that strategy is all about is, you know, let's say you own a hundred shares of of Apple, 160 bucks at $16,000. And you, you want to collect some income on it, not just the dividend. Of course they pay a nice dividend, but let's say you want to uh, uh, collect some income on that and mm -hmm. you can sell a call upside call against it. And you could do it, you know, month after month after month. Or week after week after week, and 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 collect uh, collect nice premium as long as you don't get uh, the stock uh, called away from you. So that, that that's a covered call. It's a nice um, passive, nice, well, it's a somewhat passive aggressive strategy uh, to to make money um, along with your um, appreciation in the stock and the dividend. Um, now the other strategy you talked about was uh, you know legging into a stock with a uh, with selling selling naked puts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you say to yourself, look, um, I see um, Google is trading at 101. I would like to have it at 95. It was mm -hmm. just there a few weeks ago, 
but it's at 101. So what do I do? You can sell a, a sell a put that um, a, a maybe a couple months out that's that's six dollars, and you collect that six dollars. And if it comes down to ninety five or so, or uh, or whatever the strike is, you 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 can get that stock at ninety five bucks because net net because you collected um, premium. So there's a lot of people out there who do that. It's a really good strategy for trying to get in to a stock at a lower price that you wouldn't mind having it put to you. That's what puts are, having a mm -hmm. stock put to you instead of called away from you, which is what a call is. That's why they call that a call option. So um, that's another good way of, of, of for investors to get into stocks at a cheaper price. And if they don't end up getting it, at least they're, they're keeping the premium and they can just write it again, and do it again. And write it, mm -hmm. if, if let's say that put goes to zero. Um, you've collected, already collected your premium. Uh, the stock is held up and you say, okay, well, look, I'll just do it again. I wouldn't mind having the stock still put to me. Um, that sort of thing. People do it over and over and over again. So it's a really good strategy. Even if you don't have the stock, you can still, um, as long as you have the cash to back it up, it, it, they're called cash um, mm -hmm. cash reserves in front of uh, mm -hmm. cash held puts. So, um, and then, so, so getting back to my strategy, what do I do? Um, I like to, I, I'm very um, aggressive on the, on the trend. I, I like to identify what direction the markets are going to go into and then proceed from there. So this morning, we saw the markets were up sharply and the VIX was down quite substantially. So I can use that combination right there to make an assessment and say, hey, look, appears the market is going to be strong today. I could, I could, I could make that statement right at the beginning of the day, and I did. And if I make that statement, I I am with the with the full notion I could be wrong. Okay. I I I have the right to I reserve the right to be wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I could make that judgment about the markets today and say, look, you know what? I mean, and, and I could see the markets were, were pretty strong in the pre-market. The volatility was down and the volatility sellers have been ruthless in selling volatility all during the day. Mm -hmm. And the opposite of that trade is to go long the ES futures. So if I make that assessment, I want to be long the market. I want to be buying stuff whether it's indexes like the SPY or the QQQ or whether it was Apple or whether it was Netflix or what, whatever the case may be, my eye is on going long. I'm not necessarily looking for downside here. Now, of course, we could run into a road a, a roadblock at some point in time. You know, some some uh, Fed governor could, could, could squash the rally of the day by saying something. And we, we've seen that happen more times than we can care to admit. But those things, those things happen. The, Trend of the day today, identified early this morning, was up. And that's all I needed to know. I don't know what it is tomorrow. We'll see We'll, we'll see what it is in the morning tomorrow. So I, I'm an aggressive trader on that side. If it's down, if I can make that assessment, that judgment, I will be buying puts. That's, that's where it's at. Perfect. Thank you. Are you, uh, what time frames are your focus? It sounds like you're day trading or you're a swing trader or both. What type of time frame do you work with? I'm more a swing trader, Rosanna. I, you know, listen, if I'm forced to do a day trade, which may, which would mean, well, listen, if I bought it, if I bought an option at like $7 today and all of a sudden it went to like 15, no, I'll uh, take you that. know what? I'm, 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 I'm I'd be, a, I'd be a fool. <laughs> not to sell it right yes you know it, it, it's a it, it's a it was a good call i got in at the right time yeah. i took some risk and i got a double on it so okay. i'm selling it you know i'm or else i'm rolling it or whatever i want to mm -hmm. stay with it I'm, i you know i i like to roll options i like to take my original risk off the table mm -hmm. or a good portion of it you know if i'm in there for a trade that costs me three thousand dollars and um all of a sudden it goes up to five why wouldn't I take that other that three off the table right away and then exactly. roll it into another trade? Risk management's number one. Risk management. We're always wearing our risk management hat. We have we wear different hats all during the day. Mm -hmm. um, risk management is the most important hat we have on all day. Absolutely. So when you went into your trade today, and that means that you are still holding that, uh, unless you got that double that you wanted, you would still be holding that until it reaches the price that you're looking for or it turns against you. Is that correct? Yes. But, you know, I mean, listen, you know, we, we have to also understand from the top level view, what, what, what type of market are we in? Are we in a bull market or a bear market? Bear. <laughs> We're in a bear market, right? So 
you have to use the bear market playbook. What is that? It means you hold a lot of cash, mm -hmm. keep a tight leash on your trades, book your book your trades as winners as often as you can. Mm -hmm. Don't you know have a huge loser, keep a lot of cash and have some puts on. That's the bear market playbook. And and that's what we're using right now until we turn into a, a bull market, which could be months away from now. Yeah, it could earliest. be years. Who knows? Could we be don't years, know. right? That's mm -hmm. right. Absolutely. So, I agree with that, with the cash, all of that that you just said, um, very prudent way to trade a, a bear market. And you know, um, you've traded other ones before. So you're familiar so, with so that. So I mean, I, going back to that other trade example, if I get in at seven, and all of a sudden the mm -hmm. options closed at 13. You know, what What am I looking for? Am I looking for 20? Am I looking for 25? What, 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 what's the What's the point? I think if I take my risk off the table on that day, mm -hmm. Even if it's up, even if I'm up 50 50 percent, that's that's a great win. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I bought some I bought some spy calls later in the day today at like 350, and I sold them at like 434. And it doesn't seem like that's a huge win. I think it was up 28 percent. I'll take it. Oh, absolutely. I'll take it off the table because it's, you know what? Yeah. What if we get what if we gap down tomorrow? Where's my profit going? Bye bye. Yeah. I always say it's a return on time. You know, if you can turn it that quickly in just, you know, a few minutes or a half hour, take it. It's great. You know, there's a few axioms that don't work in a bear market, quite a few actually. Buying the dip and letting your winners run. I mean, it's not something you just sit and, you, and watch your green because uh, it'll probably go red, you know, if you hold it too long. So very, very smart there. Um, you know, what expiration date do you go into when you do trades like this? Do you do weeklies? Do you do monthlies? How far out do you go? Well, you know, of course, um, with volatility being low right now, it means option prices are are, are getting cheaper, mm -hmm. right? And, what, and simply put, you know, the, the, the expected move in the markets is, is, is rather uh, narrow. So we, yes. we gapped up 30 handles today. We went up like plus 56 or something like that. And finished a little bit right around, right around that area. So actually the, the, even though the, the market was up over one and a half percent today, almost one and a half percent today, the, the, the actual move was only, was less than 1% um, from opening to close. So um, I, I, I look in terms of, you know, what, what is a good risk return payoff for me? And what is the, what are the odds of that trade actually going to be in the money? So um, if, if I, if, if I want to take a, a little bit more risk on a trade, I might go further out of the money, but I have to understand that my probability for losing has just increased. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I want that, actually, I want that number to go down. So um, if I'm willing to pay up more money for an option, then, and, and for a little bit more safety to knowing that I can stand that trade a little bit longer, look at it. We had, uh, we had a discussion in, in the class that I, I teach uh, last week. And I said, uh, would you rather buy five options at a dollar or one option at five, five bucks? And you know, the dollars are the same, right? 500, you know, $500. Mm -hmm. Well, so let me ask you, Rosanna, what would you rather do? What would you Personally, rather? Personally, I'd rather buy five at $1 because that gives me that? more. Um, I like to, because I like to scale into positions and scale out. So if I have five options, I, I take some profits. I'd say I sell like maybe half of them take my principal out and let the rest, you know, maybe get a little more of a win. Okay. So that's a good risk management uh, uh, formula in case, if the option's working for you. But what if the option's not working for you? Let's say those options you bought, the five options at a dollar, were out of the money, but you had a month to go. Yet the one option that you bought at $5 was slightly in the money. Um, and basically the stock went nowhere for the next month who's going to win who's going to do better well you i rather have it not really go that, that i mean if you're not going to go anywhere then it'd be better to be with the five dollar one than it would be to have the five one dollar ones exactly so so my point here is this is that you have to expect the worst but hope for the best mm -hmm. in something like this and 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 the reason why we do that is because you know what we can't see the future nobody's nostradamus we only we only had one of those Nobody can see what's going to happen into the future. So we have to, um, you know, demonstrate good, solid risk management. And, and, you know, again, for some people, the risk management is, 
you know, um, maybe you would, you, Rosanna, you would stay with that trade for a certain amount of time or the uh, uh, amount of loss is a certain level. And you'd say, mm -hmm. that's it, I'm done. Or, or like me, if you, if about the higher dollar option, you have a little bit more tolerance for pain for a little bit longer, because listen, you don't know when that stock's going to move. What if you're in that trade for uh, a, what if that's a 30 day trade, Rosanna, and you got out of it at day 24 and all of a sudden the stock really moved on day 28. You wouldn't feel, you'd feel awful, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> why did I get out of there four days early? You know what? Why couldn't I just stick that around? That happens all the time. Sure. It's part of trading. It's unfortunate, well, but yeah, that's part of it. That's right. That's right. You know, and, and, and listen, I've seen big moves happen for stocks right on the last day even in the last hour of trading for those mm -hmm. options expiring. So, yeah, we have to have that accountability and, you know, it just accept that it happens and it's, it's how quickly you come back from that loss or that opportunity cost. So that, you know, it's an unrealized loss Let's say you sell it and then it takes off, you know, it's about how quickly you can recover. And that's what true success is, you know, because we all make mistakes. We all lose. Look, any trader, you know, some people want to say they always win untrue. I think the average win rate is between 45 to 55 percent or something like that. For but on traders. Twitter, it's like 97 percent. Right. I think so. Maybe very close to that. So, you know, it's about, you know, I keep my tight, my stops tight in this market. You know, if it goes against me you know, I'm just I'm out, you know, and then, you know, it's better to take that small little loss. And then, you know, and we've had some great wins in this market. The semiconductors have been great. You know, I've loved that trade. I've been, I love the, the on, you know, the, the great, you know, semiconductor ALGM, ACLS. I mean, you've had so many great ones. So there's been some great plays in this market and they've been not so great. You just got to follow the trend and you got to ride that wave. And if you catch the wrong wave, well, you better hop out, you know, because it's probably going to keep going in the other direction. So, um, and that's what the bear market teaches us. I think, you know, they say a bull market teaches you bad habits, a bear market teaches you good habits. So we're learning as we go. Um, you know, I wanted to ask you about spreads. I love spreads. So with the lower VIX, are you doing more of debit spreads versus the credit spreads? Yes, I'm doing a lot more spreading of, uh, of, of options these days because um, look, you know what? Um, I'm I'm gonna, for instance, I'm I'm in a uh, I'm gonna spread a couple of spreads on AMD and Google. Mm -hmm. So AMD, you know, I, what I can do is I can I can go out a little bit further in time and buy some calls, but they're expensive, you know, especially after uh, they're, they they're after earnings are are out in April. I'm I'm in some June some June AMD calls. They're a little expensive. So what I'm doing is I'm selling the April calls above it. That's called a diagonal spread. Um, and, and a diagonal calendar I like the, spread. Yeah, I like the diagonals a lot. Yeah, so the diagonals are great. I mean, you know, you can build in a little profit margin in case the mm -hmm. stock goes up. Um, and then by just by waiting for that uh, shorter term option to decay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm doing a lot of that. Uh, I'm taking advantage of the the option premium, which is really somewhat, in, in, some, in some cases is extremely elevated versus what they should be, right? The markets are telling us that there's, minimal moves going to be happening based because the VIX is so low. I want to, I want to take advantage of, you know, of, you know, when I'm buying some Google calls, if there's some uh, good premium up there on the hundred or the 105 calls, well, listen, I'll mm -hmm. take that. And if I get called away, fine. That means my, my long call option is going to mm -hmm. be, um, be worth so much more in, in value. Absolutely. I like using that theta to our advantage and selling that shorter term in the diagonal. And then having a longer term, um, I tend to usually buy like three months plus and then, you know, sell within, you know, two months or less, something like that. You know, it's a sweet trade when you can have more than one of those short calls expire worthless on you. Yep. Um, and then you can help reduce the cost of your long call. Um, so diagonals are fun. I really like uh, that, that trade for sure. Um, and then directional trading on your website, it says directional trading. Um, have you been doing, um, how have you been doing that in this market? That's really the question. Well, I think it's important um, in this bear market environment that we're still in is to have some balance. So I, I, I have some long calls. I have some long call spreads. I also have some index puts, mm. which obviously didn't do well today. And I'm fine with that. In fact, 
I've, I've told people, I said, look, I, I can get in there and buy more calls or buy more bullish stuff like I did today if I have puts already working. Mm -hmm. it, it gives me that feeling that, okay, well, if something bad happens, I actually have some protection on. And I bought them cheap. They weren't expensive at all. So you know what? If, if they don't do well, then I think the gains that I can make on the long side of the call of, of the calls is going to more than exceed the losses exactly. that I have on those puts. So it's just insurance mm -hmm. against uh, against uh, the markets turning south on me um, at any particular uh, given given point in time. So I I, I just all I, all I need to do is, is is have a little bit of balance. I have some a lot of calls. I have a few puts here and there, and I'm going to be continually always having puts. I look. I always have puts on. Always have puts on. And you know people say. Well, Bob, you're just a fool. You're just throwing money out the window. No, it's not. It's it's not. It's it, that's not the point. You're smart. It's smart. Why do you have insurance? Why do you have car insurance? Why do you have health insurance? Why do you have life insurance? Protection. Fire insurance. Protection, right? In case of what? A disaster, right? What Rosanna? Accidents what if you, happen. What if you what, what you know you know what if God forbid what if you went out there without any car insurance, you got into an accident, it was your fault, you know that. That's that that could be devastating financially, uh, physically, obviously. But I mean, if you you know, um, it could be devastating to you financially, right? Mm -hmm. But if you have insurance on, which I know we all hate paying that insurance guy every year, but you know what? Mm -hmm. It's one of those necessary yeah. evils. Can't Financial insurance mm -hmm. with puts is is almost just as mandatory as that. Absolutely, I love your style. I love your thinking. Um, I think you're so smart. You're a really smart options trader. And, you know, it's so important to have protection on at all times, which brings me to the question, what is the meaning of no excuse to not have puts working in a bear market? I guess it's exactly what you just said. Yeah, I say that a lot. I think, you know, a lot of people give up the, uh, you know, the, the, you know, you should, if you're, if you're in a, a room that's spinning really fast, Rosanna, do you want to be in the middle of the room without any without holding the thing, or do you want to be have your have one hand against the wall? Of course. You can. Yeah. <laughs> so that's really the that that's really what I'm talking about. You know, if you when when the room starts spinning fast, you're going to get dizzy and you're going to get thrown all over the place. But if at least you have if you if you're if you're have your hand up against the wall and you're touching it, and at least you have some reference point. And that's that's all I'm saying is that have a reference point and understand that the markets are not going to go straight up to the sky. Even when we're in a bull market, you know, there's going to be down days, even mm -hmm. when we're in a bull market. So you have to, uh, I, we, we've seen in bear markets, some of the most spectacular bullish rallies in bull markets. We've seen some of the worst action to the downside than we've ever seen to, in, in bull markets. So you have to be able to protect yourself uh, at all, at all times. Nobody's going to tell you what tell you what to do and tell you that well maybe i will but i mean you know if, if anybody wants to listen to me um but you know, i think it's important to 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 have put protection on um at all times and you know it, it, and believe me when when you have days where you open up down hard like yesterday mm -hmm. you know you're, you're happy you have some put protection on absolutely and that's why i love using spreads you know you have a mix of both and it's like you it's better instead of trying to go for those home runs and, you know, you, you know, just buying like naked calls or something, you have a little protection on both sides. So whichever direction it goes, you're protected. And that's key. I love how you apply your mindset with life to the markets and you need to protect yourself with the market. Uh, do you utilize options flow with your options trading? Yeah, um, it, it's an important uh, component in my uh, decision making process on trying to find options. But you know, there, there, there's something that a lot of people don't understand about options flow. You don't use it all. In fact, the the uh, when I look at options trading flow, I'm throwing out about 70% of that of that flow. It's not important because mm -hmm. it's either spread or it's even hedged or it's just something ridiculous. Somebody buying a $400 call on Tesla, which expires on Friday. <laughs> it's useless, right? Absolutely. So why, they paid a penny for it. They bought like 50,000 contracts at a penny. Why? So I throw about 70% of that away. So I'm really utilizing about 30%. And within that 30%, I'm throwing away another 70% of that. So it's mm -hmm. really a very small amount of, of option trading that uh, option trades on the flow that really, really matter. 
you know, and, 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 and so it's, it's an important, I've been, I've been reading options flow for over 15 years. Um, I just really, um, just, it's just more of like the past seven to 10 years where um, some of these vendors have come on the, come online and, and really uh, made it a lot easier and a lot quicker for us to see what's going on. But there's a lot of people who don't really put out information that's correct. They see big options flow, but they don't see mm -hmm. the other side of it. They don't see that something has been spread or maybe there's some mm -hmm. stock behind it or something like that. So that big option flow, while it may be impressive, it's not useful. It's not giving you good information about what's happening with that particular stock. Absolutely. Thank you. So like we'd like to go into your mind. If you could walk us through this type of protection spread trade. I know you mentioned one that you did earlier today, but if you could just take us through a typical of your style, that would be wonderful. So, so protection trade. Um, so look, I mean, I, I, you know, what realized that the markets were up strong all day today and, and volatility was coming down and I just took advantage of buying, buying some puts out for next week, next Thursday. Right. Mm. And, the reason why is, uh, and actually the following following Monday after that. Now, now remember something. Next Friday, Mark April seventh, is a holiday. The markets are closed for Good Friday, and um, but but all but but economic data is coming out. What's coming out next Friday? Do you know? Is it the labor data? That's correct. Yeah, the jobs report. And That's it has the jobs. Ten, yeah. Doesn't that have a tendency to move markets? Absolutely. So Monday we could open in one major direction or the other, right? And nobody can, unless you trade futures, nobody can do anything about it. <laughs> so, so I want to, I want to, I want, I want to open up some, some, some put trades um, because if we do get an overbought condition in the next couple of days, I want to be prepared and ready for the markets to turn. And even if I'm going to take a short-term loss on those puts, I know that they're insurance anyway, but even if I'm going to take a minor short-term loss in the interim um, on paper, um, at least I have some protection going in case we turn south um, nice. sometime next week. So that that's an example of, of some protection that I bought today. Wonderful. Well, Bob, we'd love to know about your explosive options and what you offer. You obviously know very well what you're doing. You are an expert with options trading. Tell us about your mentorship programs and how you can teach others um, your options trading. So thank you, Rosanna. So the, um, the, the options trading service that I have is directional options trading, uh, which just my idea is stuff that I trade in my client accounts uh, as well too. For, for most people who are more passive that they, they're not so aggressive and, and active in, in, in trading their own accounts. They're relying on my trade ideas uh, to help them move forward and grow their accounts. I also have the chat room, Rosanna, which is great. Um, it's an amazing, wonderful place with 250 some odd people in the room every single day. I love going to the room every day. It's just, uh, it, it, it really gets my juices flowing. There's a lot of people with a lot of ideas, a lot of knowledge there. It's not just me. I, I tell everybody, look, it's a, it's a it's a wonderful community that I just started. I'm not the... The most important person in in the room here. I do try and lead, but um, you know, a lot of people have have come across come to me and said, "Look, you know, if it wasn't for this chat room, you know, I would I'd be completely lost." And uh, you know, it's it a great place for for people to learn um, uh, and and make a little bit of money and and grow themselves. Listen, it's all for me. It's about it's a journey. It's not a destination. Absolutely. You know, if you're there, if if you're telling me. Hey, look, I'm 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 here to make a hundred thousand dollars. I'm like, well, great. Well, what are you going to do after you do that? Oh, I make another hundred thousand. Okay, great. What are you going to do after that? It's it's a progression. It's a journey. And you know what? I mean, for me, it's about let's enjoy the journey. Let's take a mm -hmm. walk together and walk down that path and try to learn. Everybody learn something together, and 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 grow our accounts that way. It's not about you know. I mean, I always tell people, Rosanna. You know, if I have somebody in the room that I've been with. Um, I want to check in with them five years from now. Say, hey, how's it going? Well, you know, Bob, I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm learned, I've learned a lot about the markets. I'm not killing it, but I'm making I'm making a good living here. And I'm, learn, I'm, I'm, I'm doing better and better each and every day. If I hear somebody give me that answer, I'm, I'm satisfied. I'm happy I've done my job teaching them. I love that attitude. Thank you so much for what you bring to Twitter and you share with everyone. I love your daily bites. 
that's some fantastic reading and it's right on point. Um, I think you offer a fantastic service. And I'm going to just tell you and tell everyone, the listeners, you are the real deal, in my opinion. Uh, you know what you're talking about. Many people act like they know what they're talking about, but you really do. So we love learning from you. And thank you so much for spending time with me today and sharing all these wonderful insights. My pleasure, Rosanna. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, let's do this again uh, down the road. Absolutely. I look forward to it. Thank you so much, Bob.